So. I have to give major props to Ricky Kawahara for this episode, man. Like, yo. Now, you got now I've recorded an episode of reaction for this for this for this ep, uh, recorded an episode reaction for this episode, guys. So that will probably be dropping sometime tomorrow. Um, so get look forward to that one, guys. But I have mentioned this countless times in other reviews of Sao. That if there's one, I've mentioned my problems with the series multiple occasions, but I've also mentioned how multiple times that I don't like Liz and Silica. I can't stand Silica, hate her, never liked her. Liz, I've only been mad to tolerate her. She's fine, you know. But after this episode, first of all, I got a major props to her voice actress. She did an amazing job, but Liz is officially over. Liz is officially over with me. I can now say that I like Liz. Now, I'm not going to say I like her more than Sion, sure shit, Asuna, Philia, you know, Sugu even. She is no, and she's still in the same placement as I will put her on the uh, SAO waifu tier list, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, after this episode... You can really see how much Reki's right has improved. And I had a lot of things, you know, little, like, a lot more concern to this episode. What happened in this episode. What was going on. What's led to. I was a little bit worried that I was like, oh, come on, Reki. You were doing so good. Like, isolating Kirito and Asuna throughout all of Athletes, away from everybody else, away from Liz, away from Sil Silica, away from Sugu, Sion, away from all the main girls, and keeping Austin and Sue and, and Kirito in their own separate location, far away from them, was the best decision he ever made. And, you know, it really gave us time to really get to know Kirito, you know, gave us more time with Asta, gave us more time to uh, to establish and, you know, uh, grow on the relationship. You saw a lot more of that. You really see how much Asta cares for her. And even with Kirito for a sense, of course, you know, there was that amazing meetup that they had last week, which you guys saw, I was praising that. But what would happen in this episode, I was getting a lot concerned because... Um, we'll get more into detail when we get to those parts of the episode, but with where it led, you know, with Sion getting in there, and Suga getting in there, and it looks like Liz, and C and all the other guys are coming in there. At first, I was hesitant on that, because I was because I was scared that Rekki was going to fall right back into his, to a lot of the original trappings that, well, I will always call SCO a flawed masterpiece, I love SCO, I will defend that show to the day I die, I fucking love that show, you guys know how much I love it. But I was scared Rekki was going to fall in a lot of the same trappings he had back with Season 1 and Season 2. After this episode, all those fears are gone away. Except maybe the harem shit. That's not the only thing I'm kind of still worried about. But besides that, we good. So, with me getting my thoughts out of there, with just my overall thoughts. Let's just jump right into the episode and let's just discuss it. That's because there's a lot to unpack here. So we start this episode off. Also, guys, one thing: if I'm not as loud as I usually am or as me as I usually am in these reviews, because I'm recording this review really late at night and my mom is sleeping in the next room over from me, so I gotta keep it down so she doesn't know I don't wake her up. So if I'm a lot quieter than I usually am or I'm not as energetic or as lively or whatever, uh, that's why. Just want to give you guys a quick heads up. So we start this episode off with Beerkley and the administrator. They're talking over a nice, you know, fire dinner. They're drinking some wine. The administrator sitting or laying on a velveteen couch. Might want to give the velveteen dream a call. Just saying. <laughs> and so, and she asks him if she, if he's ever had a premonition about death. And he's like, a premonition about death? Yes. And then he says back when he was listening to these spirits, uh, when he was against, like, I think it was like said one of the former Dark Generals or someone else, he had a feeling that he was going to die that day. And the minister tells him that he she brought that he brought his head uh, soon after. And since then, you haven't had one. And he says, you know what? I can't even remember. And he asks, like, you know, but surely the administrator? Why would you ask the question? Surely the administrator is free of such of such things. And he's like, oh, Bierkeli, you don't know, do you? 
I always dream of death. I always sense death. I I see it once as soon as I wake up. I sense it once, you know, it's in my dreams. You know, she's always sensing death because she can't control because there are still some things out there that she doesn't control, and that keeps her up at night. So, we then have her back to the present. Miracle is sitting in his tent. He's like, I think I finally understand what you meant that day. And then he leaves his tent. We have her back with, um, uh, with Asuna and the guys. There's, um, Ronnie, she's feeding Kitty to, and I, and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a damn moment. Shouldn't Kitty, shouldn't Asuna be doing this? Shouldn't she be feeding her boyfriend? You know, just saying, because you know that's you know that's, uh, and also she's also Kirito's in-game wife, so why didn't she do it? <laughs> but she's sitting there eating a sandwich that doesn't look nearly as good as her sandwiches. Just saying that. I mean, like that sandwich looks fine, but it ain't an Austin. And we've seen Austin sandwiches, and they go says I mean, like every time she would bring those out, it was like, oh, the the gift from the gods has come about, has come by, you know. So anyway, <laughs> so they're talking amongst themselves. Um, and Ronnie comments about Kirito's looking a lot health, a little bit healthier now, today, and this, what the appetite, and <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was Alice that made a joke saying, you know, I'm sure sleeping next to four beauties helped them out, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, Ricky, please don't fall into your old habits, because, <laughs> you know, um, because I was like, eh, because you know, I remember before I was kind of worried with the with this, with this kind of scene in the last four, ep about in the last episode with these four coming after him and they all kind of like try to warm up each other with their experiences with Kirito. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But uh, after that, so then the, I guess the war, the horns of war blow off. Allison and the guys all get back into their suits. We then never see. Ro by the way, after this section of the episode, that little section, we never see Ronnie or uh, Kirito's mentor. At all throughout the rest of the episode, we never see them again. We don't see them in battle. We don't see them charging. We don't see them anything. We might pro we'll probably see them again in the final episode, where all hell breaks loose. You got this epic, and you'll have an epic final battle, which you know definitely I'm gonna be reacting to that as well, because that's hopefully we do get that final battle, you know, because I was expecting we were gonna get some action in this episode, which we kind of got, but not really. Uh, hopefully it's in the last episode of you know the season of Alice's nature, this part of Alice. So anyway, afterwards, Kibito or not Kibito. Austin and the guy, um, or Bierkali, excuse me, is using like his little uh, like telescope thing, whatever, with his glasses, and he says, you know, that those outsiders, you know, those those from those outsiders from the real world, are using some unorthodox. They're he's taking a risk, and by that I mean he literally has the I forget the groups, you know, the guys that you know the guy the brawlers. We'll just call them the brawlers, the the like you know rescued people. So he has them like legit walking on like a tightrope, getting over to the cabin that that uh, uh, chasm that Austin had created to get to the other side to where the humans are to you know, take them out. And we get a little flashback. And we see them guy climbing it, and then a couple of, like a gust of wind blows over, and a couple guys fall off. I'm actually kind of surprised they didn't use the Von Helen scream, you know, the ones that are in Star Wars. The ah, you know, I'm surprised they didn't use that for the screams, but whatever. Uh, so you know, they so we see a couple of them dying, and then we get a flashback to when uh, Gabriel told them, you know, do that. I don't care if there's casualties, you know, we gotta do it. And he goes on about, you know, that we're that this is our that this is even though this is the like the, that that this that the goal for the all the five tribes of the of the dark territory was to invade, invade the human empire, but it's all over, you know, this someone called the Priestess of Light. And he's like, Hurry guys, hurry. We see a couple guys finally make it uh make it to the other side. You know, they help a couple help out some of the other guys and just kinda of sit there, taking a deep breath, enjoying the fact that they're on steady that they're on solid ground again. Before we hear the story, before we see the horn, the the horns, horses coming by, where we see Asuna, Alice, and all the other, and a bunch of the other, and the rest of the Tyranny Knights right along Beerkley, all charging in on horseback, we just see them slicing and dice. At this point of the episode, and I mention this because you know I was because you know what happens in the middle part of the episode, I'm like, all right, let's get down. It's about to get hype in here. We're gonna see Alice give being an absolute badass, and it's gonna be lit. We got some good shots. We got even got a couple good shots of Asuna slicing and dice, which was nice to see. And you know, you got um, you got the leader being like, yeah, I mean, oh! you know, and you know, he's like, you know, we have to, that. What is this? You call this a battle? How could we have taken all that time to train just to die like this? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, <laughs> oh man, so. Um, afterwards, he's just, you know, his tears in his eyes, because I've seen his, all his fallen comrades die like this, and he's like, forgive me, forgive me, alright, before we then head for back to Gabriel, 
So Gabriel's like, okay, so if we're so, it looks like that the human that the human empire AIs are superior. And he's like, no, in terms of adaptability, they're on a completely different level. And he's like, yo, don't fail, Krita. So then we get back to Krita, and the man has reset at the time for Alcide, because you know the time of Alcide is like, if like say um I forget the exact time, but like as I mentioned later in the episode, you know like it's been like about ten hours since Austin went in there, so it's about been about a year since um. It's been about a year where in the underworld, you know, that's pretty much the you know, time frame that's been going on. If it was like, it was, it was like 30 seconds, it was like 30 days or something. I forget, I forget the exact uh, numbers, but whatever the case may be, the time's been reset to where it's pretty much just going in real time. Now, I couldn't get a good look at what the exact exact number was, but it looked like it was on like a thousand X, you know. So he sends out, then we head over to America. <laughs> Where you have people, you have people speaking English, and uh, okay, I have to give a one props for at least trying because with a lot of animes that have characters from different nationalities, they don't even really bother to you know have them speak that that character's near language or give them an accent or anything. We see it sometimes in dolls where like you know like Infinite Strat for example, you have a bunch of girls from different nations, they all have different accents and I by the way I love Charlotte, she's best girl and I love that French accent she has. It's super cute. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there like I love Charlotte. Oh she's like my favorite character in that show. <laughs> I love Charlotte. And that French accent is just <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Uh, you have stuff like Steins Gate Zero, where in the Japanese version, actually, now, I could, now I only know this from, like, clips I've seen, I, cause, you know, I'm watching the show with the dub. They actually have, uh, I forget the, do the doctor's name that's working with, uh, with, um, uh, I forget her name, but, like, you know, the, the legal lolly chick, and, uh, that's working with, Ama that's working with Amadeus and everything. The dude's American, you actually have him speaking English occasionally, with, you know, which turns out Joseph to be English, but it's always good. You've got shows like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, which is infamous, or memed for its English, you know. But then you got stuff like Vinland Saga, where you have characters that, you know, are from, like, Norse mythology or Norse, and they have characters like, you know, there's, like, this one episode where... Uh, Thorfinn was like, oh, does anyone speak Norse around here? But they're all speaking Japanese. There's all the times with, like, Thor, Kel, he's speaking to, like, this, like, to, like, this leader of this, you know, military in Norse, but they speak it to, uh, to, like, his own guys in English, but it's all in Japanese, so you're just like, is it too much to ask for some, is it too much to ask for some fucking English around here, you know? So, I gotta give A1's at least props, but my god, who did they get for these roles? Like, first off, now the accents themselves and the English itself wasn't terrible, but it wasn't, it's definitely one of the better Japanese English, you know, scenes in there, because I gotta give them props, like, they, like, legit, the whole scene of this episode, at least this whole section of the episode with these guys when we were in America, was all done in English, you know, completely done, they had Japanese subtitles, which there was, like, subtitles on top of those, I don't really know why, because they're speaking English, but <laughs> they got Japanese subtitles on top of them, you know, the accents weren't super thick, it didn't sound like English, like, and stuff like that, before, like, Jojo, where they're like, where they're like, uh, see, it's like, uh, you know, be like, za, you know, da, like, you know, stuff where it like, that's, like, very meme-worthy, like, it, but, at the same time, the, there was so much over-delivery in the lines of, my god, the stereotyping. <laughs> like, I'm like, is this legit what Japan thinks of us, or thinks America is like? Because you had this big, you had this, had this big guy on his computer with a beard, and he's wearing a, t a white t-shirt that says USA on it, and behind him is a blonde chick. <laughs> I'm like, and we also see the Statue of Liberty, and I'm just like, is this legit what Japan thinks of us Americans? <laughs> like, my God, being able to receive you get a stereotype of this bad man, I'm just like, jeez. <laughs> but anyway, you know, and I went for, there was like so much over delivered. They're like, it, like, the way it sounded here was like how people think English dubs sound. Like, there was tons of overacting, it didn't really sound all that natural. I wasn't going to say it sounded forced or anything, but it looks like, I don't know what A1 got. I don't know if they just got some random schmucks off the street that lightly speak English and they just threw them in the recording booth. I don't know if they legit got some of their, fu some of their animators who could speak English to just th threw them in the recording booth. Or maybe they got legit voice actors that could speak English. I don't, I don't think it's that one, because no way they would sound like that. But 
whatever the case may be, you know, I'm not going to harp on too much, but I just got to bring it up, man. Like, the, the overacting here was uh, was ridiculous, man. It, it, it's it's mean worthy, but, you know, come on. But, like, that's I got to give a props for at least try. I got to give A1 props for at least try. So, anyway. And what's going on here is that, um, what that, uh, Krita is doing, what he's doing is legit pretty much uploading the, the underworld to make it playable to other people. And you got all these people from, like, the States being like, Oh, an open beta for a Fiona Mamu! Ooh, you know, and everyone is just, yo, keep on. Like, this thing just pops out of nowhere, and people are coming in draw. Excuse me. Or people are coming in drove, be like, oh yeah, sign me up, hell yes, I'm signed up for this. I'm like, you know, you guys know the SAO scene wasn't that long ago. Like, if I remember correctly, it's been like about three years since SAO and, you know, the time frame of SAO from, uh, from where it began to where it ended. It's been like three years since SAO happened. You know, the actual, like, incident with the game and everything. And yet here you have all these Americans just blindly flocking to this game with, like, they just came out of nowhere. How they even got access to this, or even they found out about this, is a is an anomaly to me in, in itself, but whatever. And, and they're just like, oh, okay, like, look. I mean, we Americans are many things. Stupid at points. But we ain't that stupid. <laughs> at least I like to think we're not. But anyway, I'm not going to harp on that too much. But I was just like, y'all really gonna just come in droves for this game, this VR MMO that just came out of nowhere? Like, are we all legit, like, are you, is your, like if y'all for legit forgot about uh, the SAO incident? But whatever. I have a turn like a harp on. Then, uh, we also see a shot of Yui, where we see, where she sees, like, this grid on Earth. Like, in this, like, globe, 3D globe. And then there's this marker, like, around where Japan is. Because I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, Yui isn't, like, inside Austria's phone. Or she can, like, transport herself into different areas or whatever. And she sees that, and there's a bunch of other lines coming towards Japan. Of course, these are meant to be the servers of all the guys from America. They're jumping in on this new beta for this new VR MMO, you know, the Underworld. So, she's like, this is bad. So, she legit... <laughs> And keep on, at this point, it's about 3 in the morning. She calls up Sion and Sugu and tells them, you know, get out of bed, get out of your apartment, go to t take a taxi, go to this address, here's the fastest route, you know, I'll explain later, and like I four. Keep on, it's like 3 in the morning right now. How, I'm surprised, like, and they did not look tired at all. I, like, I get they're gamers, and we gamers don't know what the hell sleep is, but it's 3 in the morning, and they, and they got school. So they should at least look a little tired. <laughs> But whatever. Like I, I don't know why I'm nitpicking so much, but this is just stuff I notice. I'm not even. I'm, it's not. This isn't stuff I'm complaining about. Just stuff I notice. Like, you know, it's like three in the morning. But anyway, so Sion and Sugu get out there. They call a taxi. You know, and we head over back to you know the to uh, to Wrath. We head over back there. You got the Korean dude. He's like trying to stay up. He's trying to stay up, but he can't really. Everyone else is asleep. So, uh, you know, the only guy that's work out, that's woken up is, is Kikoka, and you know, but also you know, um, uh, Kaima's girlfriend. She's also asleep. So the dude's just trying to stay awake. You know, mentions how it's been about ten hours since she walked, since she went in. So it's probably been about a year. You know, in game time. So then, uh, some dude, and so then the phone starts ringing, and, Ki and, you know, the Korean dude just tells him, hey, Kikoka, you know, answer the phone. And he's like, oh. And so, he's like, oh, and then answers the phone. Now, I don't know if the man was just, you know, just, you know, dozing, was just, you know, uh, you know, staring into his face at that moment, or the man just sleeps with his eyes open. But either way, it did kind of look a little off, man. And I don't know if the man just sleeps with his eyes open or not, but whatever. And standing, by the way. But, <laughs> so he answers the phone. You know, and then and then one of the guys and the dude tells like, oh uh, yeah, so this is Kikoka, right? You know, like the leader of Wrath or whatever, or the uh, STL stuff. Comes in there, asks him about, it tells him about how these two girls came in here unannounced. And he says that they're about high, that they're like no more than high school girls, and you know that they came out here to you know con told me to contact you and told them to check the uh, FTL rate, I think it was called. And so the Korean dude checks it out and and he knows that it's out real time. They're like, wait, when did this happen? And so then he asks if he got their names. And he says, yeah, I did, but there's no way in hell these are their real names. And the names were Sion and Sugu. So then we see Sion, and while it's going on, we see those two walking up these stairs. And they, by the way, these girls, they, they're walking with a purpose at this moment. They're walking with a purpose. So they walk up there, and once they get there, they see these two, you know, these two beds where you can pretty much hook up to, you know, to the F these two FDL machines. Hook, and so to hook them up and to get them right in there. 
Now, at this point, I started to get a little nervous because, like I mentioned before, if there's one thing I mentioned, like I mentioned before, the best thing that uh, Reki Kawahara did when he made, when he was writing this arc, was keeping Kirito, was isolating Kirito and Asta away from everybody else. Away from Suga, away from Asta, away from Sion, away from Liz, Silka, away from all, you know, those girls. You know, and keeping, the, and just letting them focus and letting us to breathe and just, you know, really developing their characters. Because, you know, so we don't get any more of that bullshit that's like plagued SAO of, you know, of the harem shit. You know, Sion, Sugu, Liz, Phil, Silka, all trying to make moves on Kirito and Kirito just lets it happen, you know. None of that bullshit, you know. And at this point, I started to get a little worried about that because, you know. Like I mentioned before in my review, it started to read those those same problems I had with SCO season one, season two, started to rear their ugly heads last week when you saw those girls kinda of like competing or like, you know, trying to one up each other with their with their little experience with Kirito. So at that point I was getting nervous. But then once Liz and then once uh, C, uh Sugu and Seon got involved and we see them getting into those uh, you know STL machines, at this point I'm getting a little bit more nervous because you know this is more of them and I'm really starting to get scared that they might, you know, that Ricky might slowly start to go back into his old habits. I'm hoping to God he doesn't and I started to get a little nervous. And then so, but I, but I wasn't going to harp on it or be complete too much because like I mentioned before, these were like the only other two f main females in SCO outside of Alice that I actually like, you know. So I wasn't going to harp on too much. And see more of Sion in action, I'll always be down for that because I love Sion. So anyway, then then we head back to, you know, to back to, Al, to, back to Alfheim with, uh, with uh, Sugu, with, uh, not Sugu, with Liz, uh, uh, you know, Klein, and the rest of the guys. And so, and then now at this point, I realize, oh, this episode ain't gonna be focused on Asuna kicking ass and taking names on the battlefield. And at this point, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it was just kind of a waste for me doing an episode reacting to it. Now, I wasn't gonna stop recording the, my reaction to it and just watch the episode as I will. I wasn't gonna do that. But I was like, oh, this kind of this episode was kind of pointless for me to do a reaction to because nothing really is gonna happen. And during this section. I was legit, I was not, I was legit starting to not really like this episode. I mean, I wasn't going to come out here and hate it, but I was definitely probably going to come out here and say this is probably like the weakest episode of this season, you know, of this season of Alice's H, you know, this 12 episode War of the Underworld season. Like, cause, you know, we've gotten a lot of banger episodes, love episodes with great animation, but an episode like this, you know, I was starting to be like, eh, this one's kind of not that strong, you know, but, which will dug, get dug in that about a bit, but, once we got to like the like the last half of the episode, when I mentioned before when we got to like the speech, all that changed. So yeah, so let's discuss this scene. And so um, Klein is going on about like, oh man, Kirito got himself in trouble again. You know, this time with an AI by the name of Alice. Man, this is so over the realms of gaming. You know. And then you know, uh, Yui says that you know that they're most likely to use Alice for like a weapon, you know, for wrath for both domestic and international warfare, and that Kirito and Austin need to stop it. And but he also says that the guys they're working for are probably working with you know like American military and, and American intelligence agencies. So yeah, we got the NSA, the FBI, and even the CIA on this shit, boys. So we got some we got this is definitely way this is way above all of our pay grades, you know. You know this is this is we in some deep shit at this point. And once and she said that this is probably the work of the US military. Liz is like I said the US military? Do you mean the American army? And I'm like, yes, Liz. Do you know any other countries with new US in the name? And by this and then by this point Liz uh, not Liz. Uh, Yui starts crying when she mentions how you know that Alice, that Alice is like you know the pretty much the child of what the sea was really meant to, meant to do was create Alice. You know that all all the work that has happened in VR and most starting with this, all the people that have been in there, all their experiences and shit. And while this is going, first off, I have to just say this. I don't know why the hell she's crying. I think it's might because she's like, oh, you know, because she's an AI too. And so seeing another AI like this and seeing the fruits of his la of, of the labors of the seed, Reki of, you know, uh, Akihiko Kairaba, maybe brought her to the ears. I don't know also to watch why he was crying. So, and while this is going on, there's flashbacks from both from season one, which, man, seeing season one clips was quite interesting because you just see how far this series has come and how much more money A1 has thrown at this series since that first season. I mean, like, my, I mean, it still looks good, but my god, when you compare it to what it is now, man, it's like, it's like not even the same series, you know, it's weird. But, 
And then Liz and Silica start crying, or not crying, they're tearing up. And Liz is like, oh, you know, I, I also know, I also was, at this point, but for some ungodly reason, one of the, one of the flashbacks they showed off was when, uh, was Asuna's rape scene. They legit played a flashback, and now it wasn't like one of the bigger parts of that scene, like they didn't show her ripping her clothes off, or licking her tears, none of that shit, which, my god, yo, now, you guys know how much Asuna beats me. Like, you guys say, I've, I've said it so many times, when Asuna cries or when Asuna is sad, it it, it, it breaks my heart, man. I, 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 it physically pains me to see Asuna sad, man. You guys know how much I love her. Y'all should have saw me when that rape scene was on. Every time Suko was on screen, I looked like I was about two seconds away from going Super Saiyan. I shit you not, I was pissed. Like, my anger rage. I legit want to start punching the TV. <laughs> you know? Like, I was so invested in SAO, man. Like, it was quite the experience, honestly. I was watching it with my brother. You know, he actually watched the show before me. He recommended it to me, and so we watched it, man. Oh, my God. You know, like... Y'all should have saw me when that scene happened. I was pissed off when Austin got when, when you know that rape scene was gone. Now I also can't help but watch him every time I watch rewatch. I I just can't help but laugh at you know when he starts licking her tears. Mm, yummy, like that's just too bad, man. But anyway, so without that, so that and by this point, Austin once Liz started crying, I'm just like, what the f and the rape scene. I was like, what the fuck is this? And they also showed when a uh, recon tried to confess to Leafa. Cringiest shit ever, but man, was that scene lyrics. I was just cringing, be like, man, stop while you're ahead, you know. But anyway, at this point, I'm like, what the fuck am I watching? Black. Like, you could probably also see in my face when, you know, this part of the episode was aired when I was in my reaction, but you could probably tell us my mindset, because I was just like, what the fuck is this shit? Now, I didn't hate the episode at that point, and even if the, if, the last, if the last half of it with Liz's speech wasn't in there, I would have probably given the episode a 7 out of 10, just for the first half. A six, maybe even a five. Point five, probably at the least. It would probably have been around a seven or a six out of ten. I would give this episode. But yeah, man, I just wasn't feeling the scene. So, Liz starts crying. Silica starts crying. You know, they're like, oh, you know, Yui will help you. And, you know, so please don't cry. You know, Klein and you know, Agil just saying they're like, yeah, time for us to pay back Kirito for all the good work he's done. Yada 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 yada. So then, we head over back to, like, this, like, I guess, theater area where Liz gives a speech where she has, like, pretty much all the GGO, or not all the GGO, all the Alfheim characters that we've seen previously, that we have the leaders from all the guilds all working together along with their guys, which, keep in mind, at this point, it is five in the morning. How they even had that many people show up is, just, is surprising me, because, like I before, it's five in the fucking morning. And also, one other thing I forgot to mention. One other thing I forgot to mention before we get back to that last section, which is when the episode really got good. I was like, oh, yo, Recky, like, Recky rectified a lot of what, of, and he, like, a re like, Recky did so much with that last episode, with that last speech, man. Like, uh, it was something, but we'll get to that speech in a second. I got a lot to say about that. Excuse me, I had to get some water. But they also mentioned how Agil, they like try to think of a way maybe they should try and shut it down or, you know, maybe come out there and expose it. But they said, you know, if we do that, we'll probably have the F well, they didn't say this, but pretty much they'll be like, we would, if we did, we'd probably have the FBI on our ass. You know, we'll have the NSA coming out there, adding us to some watches, then the FBI will break into our home and be like, FBI, open up! I swear to God, sir, I wasn't watching lovely porn, you know. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but anyway, that would be Daru if the FBI came in. <laughs> but anyway, so that wouldn't work. And Liz and Silica also has, you know, so and also, you know, so that would backfire. Um, and the, and uh, Aiki also mentions how the time differences between the U.S. and Japan, because in Japan it's like, like I mentioned before, it's like four in the morning at this point, but in the U.S. it's twelve thirty in L.A. and currently eleven thirty in, in or uh, at three thirty in the uh, in New York. And currently, right now, it is 1.12 in the morning when I'm recording this. <laughs> nice little fun fact for you guys. Anyway. So, um... Yeah. So, then, uh, so we got that. So, that means there will be more... There'll even... Because uh, uh, Klein goes off about having, like, Oh, we'll have, like, 10,000 forces. Or, like, 30,000 forces going to... But because the time difference is, like, a much four. It's, like, four in the morning over in Japan. That ain't gonna happen. While in the U.S., that probably will because there's a lot more active players playing games at, at like 12.30 and at 12.30 and 3.30. And so we got that. 
But then, I don't even know why Silica even said this. She says, so I guess, you know, if we told them, oh, they're real people, please don't kill them when work. And I'm like, Liz, not Liz, Silica. You, of all people, should know that gamers are assholes. <laughs> if you tell them don't do it, they'll probably do it ten times over. You know, so... I don't even know why Silica even said that. I mean, sure, she even she knows by this point that gamers are assholes. But anyway, man. So, after all that, we then head over back to the theater where it's now 5 or 2 a.m. And this is when the episode got fucking awesome, man. And I got a lot to say about Liz's speech. So Liz comes in there and tells them that, you know, together they're going to get into the underworld and that their friends need help. And that they're wondering if and they're hoping that all the guys join them, join their cause to help them out in the underworld. But they also mentioned there's going to be some problems, you know, with this idea. She also right before mentioned that this isn't a joke. This isn't, you know, this isn't a joke. This isn't a lie. I'm not bullshitting you. Well, she didn't say I'm not bullshitting you, but that's just me adding it because you guys know me. Anyway, so... <laughs> So Liz is going on about, you know, telling us about the underworld, and then the great haired chick that's part of that guild, I also don't remember her name, who cares, and she says, you know, Lizbeth, I know you and your friends that you wouldn't joke about something, there's so more because I went for it's five in the morning right now, in Japan, at least right here in this episode. So, but they're like, I find this hard to believe, the U.S., the, the AIs that want to be controlled by the U.S. military kind of little out there if you ask me and she says you said there'd be problems about you know about us com about us converting over to the underworld what are those problems exactly and actually this is something that uh, you had mentioned right before we head over back to the theater area so she says the problems are is that it's, I, if i remember correctly uh one that there's no ui so you can log out so we're back to the sao days no logging out boys you got once you're in you're in man you know so you're in there uh second one there's no pain absorber and so you so yeah which is we saw that with kirito when he got stabbed for the first time against that goblin in the what was it like i think in like the early episodes of alice station where he said you know that was like the most excruciating pain he's ever felt so there was that uh what else they also mentioned about um um uh, oh yeah and the third one was that that because of that because the uh, underworld is not like a, a normally operating VR MMO that converting your characters is there there's no guarantee that you guys can get your characters back or or I should say you can convert them back to the original game if you guys convert them hell you might even lose the characters at that point so, yeah, and of course people start talking amongst themselves, and they're like, oh, character loss, you know, what are you going to do about that? you going to make good on that? You know, is this a trap play to try to take us to weaken us tribe by tribe? Klein tries to get a word in, but Liz stands her ground, she puts her hands up, and so Klein just sits there and lets her finish. And she says, yeah, we know that we can't compensate you, and we know, well, you know, we're keenly aware the money can't buy back the characters if you guys spent some time. I mean, which, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not a big fan of, J of, our, of you know, VR MMOs. I have never been a fan of those games. I've tried getting into them a couple times with stuff like DC Online. I just can't get into them. It just ain't my thing. If you guys love War, War if you guys love VR MMOs, or not VR MMOs, just MMOs, they're like, you have Warcraft, Guild Wars 2, Elder Scrolls Online. Like, if that's your shit, then that's your shit. But I can relate to having a character that you level up and then losing it. I can understand that pain the, of months, weeks, maybe even years of you leveling up, building a character just for it to disappear. The Thanos snapped out of existence. Shitty feeling, man. Shitty feeling. That's better than us. So, and then we see this guy with the bandana being like, you know, don't tell us that. And then he straight up says, you know, oh, these friends of yours, are they the, they're SAO survivors, aren't they? And I'm like, really? It's been like three years since the SAO incident, and y'all are still on this bullshit about SAO survivors? Like, come on, man. Like, it's been three years. Get over it. <laughs> like... Not even, like, this is more, like, the hatred towards SCL survivors is more irrational than the hatred towards Brie Larson. Because I also don't understand why the hell people hate Brie Larson, man. Because, like, I've watched her in interviews. I've watched that episode, that episode she did with, uh, uh, Billy or whatever the dude's name is from, you know, Man vs. Wild. She's really, she's good, man. I like her. I don't know why people hate Brie Larson, but that's just me, man. But, yeah. And at this point, this point is when 
Liz gives off her speech. Now, I'm not going to come out here and tell y'all, like, oh, yeah, this was, like, you know, the greatest anime speech. Or this, this is better than Erwin's speech in Attack on Titan season. No, no, no. She wasn't that over. When that episode aired of Attack on Titan, both in the Japanese and the English audio, Erwin was the most over guy that day, you know, and he was and he was called the god of speeches. All of us were hyping it. Chibi was hyping it. Platinum was ch hyping it. You boy, me, was hyping it when I did my anime review then. You guys saw that in my episode react. You guys saw when I did my little reaction to when it aired on Toonami with J. Michael Tames voice acting. And I already told you guys then, if you guys saw my Twitter, I said that J. Michael Tames' version of the scene is better than the Japanese. Like, I loved his performance there. So, it wasn't that good, but my god... This speech was awesome, and Reki, I gotta give the man his due props with the um, with his writing, man. Like this man actually answered a lot of the questions, or showed us a lot of the questions that we really should have saw at the beginning of the Alfheim art that we never got, or we saw lightly of it, but nothing really in depth about it. And I really thought that Reki finally went back and showed us what the survivors of SCO had to go through, like in the aftermath. So. And first I gotta give major props to the OST. The OST, once again, was fucking epic right here, man. Like, Yuki score. Oh, I love it. So, and the guys are going on like, Oh, we know you as a you survivor secretly look down upon us and shit, you know. And I'm just like, oh, God, just get over yourselves. But, and so Alice, so then, you know, at this point, you know, Liz is looking down. She's like, it didn't work. And then we see this guy just kind of walk in. We don't see his face. We see him one more time after the end of the speech. But, uh, but we never, like, never see his face. So Liz then, we get some more flashbacks from season one, season two, before Liz finally has something to say. And she says, yeah, that us survivors have a tendency to blur the lines between reality and between reality and you know, uh, the virtual world. And at this point, and, and you know, I got like much for I gotta give major props to Alice, not Alice, to Liz is voice actress. I'm not gonna do this scene justice. Y'all just have to go back and watch for yourself. I can't wait to rewatch this again when the when it airs the dub on Toonami. It's gonna be hype. But anyway, so Liz goes on about how that this other girl, which I'm assuming she's talking about Asuna, is that they have to go to a school that's specifically made for the uh, for the survivors. And at the school, they have once a month they have to you know, go to counseling, no matter what. They always have to go to counseling, which is good, you know, keep up their mental health, make sure they let these kids go insane, you know, to keep up, you know, have them see a therapist, whatever, and, you know, they have to get asked all these uncomfortable questions, and, but, you know, and they even said that some of them have to take meds, even against their wills, but, the most shocking of these is the fact that they're actually all on a watch list. Every single, every single SAO survivor is on a potential criminal watch list. Yes, the FBI are looking at them and be like, oh, you might want to keep an eye on these guys, you know, which is really shocking to hear that. That because of how far, because of what they went through, it's that they, they, they think they're going to become criminal. Which I can understand to an extent why they would think that with the virtual world and how long they were in there, but man... Actually, hearing it was shocking to hear. Now, I gotta talk about this section right here before we get to the recipe. When when Liz just starts pouring her heart out, when she starts pouring her little heart out. As I mentioned before, I love that Ricky finally went back and actually, you know, told us what these kids actually went through. When realistically, we should have saw some of this with Kirito at the beginning of the Alfheim arc. You know, during the times where we actually saw him in the midday, but we never actually really saw anything of, you know, what what happened to him in the post of it, you know, no, no real mention of him having PTSD. Maybe this was talked about in the light novel, but I don't read the light novels. I've only watched the anime. So, like, you know, there was no talk about him having PTSD, no talk about him having, like, you know, flashbacks, because, me personally, I mentioned before in other videos, but my goal in life is to become a film director, you know? And my goal, and to, and I want to do, you know, ad, live action anime adaptations as well as MC movies. And the top two series that I want to, the top two anime series that I want to adapt into films is SAO and Hero Walk. With SAO, I'm gonna be, I'm, a, I'm gonna be real with you. If I ever get the chance to direct SAO and probably also write it, I'm going to change a lot. Like I'm going to, not so much in the I, in the Iron Credit arc, but the Alfheim arc. I'm gonna change so much of it and really make that arc a lot better than it was. One of the things I would do is I would go full-on Assassin's Creed with it 
and actually have the bleeding effect, you know, what, what you know, guys that go in the anime suffer from with Desmond, I would actually have that effect Kirito where he sees, like, you know, like, visions of, like, you know, his avatar coming towards him, and he just, you know, maybe falls to the ground, or just these visions, or maybe he gets flashes where he thinks he's back in SEO. I mean, there was, like, one nightmare sequence we got in the Alfheim art, but that was about it. And I would have this be, like, constant thing, so I liked the fact that Reki has finally gone back to that. And actually showed us that they actually, they have to take, they have to go to counseling. They have that some of these kids are on meds. And that a lot of, the, and that they're all on a watch list, which was shocking to hear. But then it gets even crazier. So, and then after that, she mentions how, you know, that all VMR, the VM, VR MMO players are viewed that way. That they're all pretty much on a watch list. Like they can't pay tax, like they're all, you know, dead weight to society. That they can't, you know... Uh, they can't. They won't. They, they refuse to face reality. That they refuse. Like they refuse to pay taxes and secret and social and securities. And then they even say that they're planning on that. They even think that there's debates about them reinstating the draft and having them go out there and forcing them to fight and serve for the country, which is the most you know ludicrous part of it all. Of having these these kids, because these are what they are. They're kids. They're just teenagers. You know, well, granted, some most of the characters that we've seen that grown up for that are pretty much adults at this point, like Austin, for example. She's currently 18 now, so go, you guys can go wild, the hentai. <laughs> but anyway, so but like here's like Austin, they've gone 18 at this point, but one just because, which is just shocking here that, these, that there's people in the government, at least in the world of SEO, that just because they like, oh, they went to a VR MMO, that's like reality. Oh, let's put them back. Let's put them in a fucking war zone, yeah, because like you know. I mean, they already got PTSD, it's not going to hurt to add more to them, give them more baggage, you know. It's crazy hearing that stuff, man. I gotta give props to my man Rekki for not only going back and pretty much rectifying up of something that really should have talked about the Alfheimer, but just having the balls to just go as deep as he did, you know, saying like, yo, yeah, they're on Watts. Yeah, people want to put these, put them in war zones. You know, it's 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 shocking, man, actually hearing that, man. It's it's crazy. At this point, the, this is when the ED pretty much hits up, and yo... I gotta give the, uh, whoever does that. I mean, I gave the direct, anime director, the episode director, some shit earlier on about like, you know, why did he put the rape scene in there? But I gotta give him some props here. Whoever's idea was to have this sweeping shot of, uh, or this circling or this uh, rotating shot where the camera p pans over um, Liz and it just goes in a circle around her as she just starts pouring her heart out that about like this is her reality. The VR, now, it's not that it's a refuge away from the real world. It's not like so much as like escapism, like she's trying to escape the real world by this. This is where she feels more comfortable. This is her reality. This is where she has real friends. She has real attachments. Real, you know, pains. This is where she has real smiles. Real tears. Which, I won't lie, I can kind of rate to that just a second because I feel a lot. Because a lot of the times, Twitter, that is me. That's pretty much almost me. Because, you know, I mean, because, you know, I'm not saying, like, you know, in reality, I'm like some, you know, some, some, some loner loser. You know, I got friends. I can talk to people, but on Twitter, man, I got the boys, you know, I got my man Platinum, I got my man, you know, Cerberus Garden, where we shoot the shit on Hirawaka, Bleach, well, not so much with him, that man, hey, that man makes, hates Bleach, and he always makes a meme about it, yo, which we always shoot the shit about, we talk about Star Wars occasionally, man, and then, of course, I got my man, Eli Moore, who I always shoot the shit with, my best friend, over on Instagram, man, so I can, under, so I can relate to her in a certain sense, because that's how I feel like I was low-key on Twitter, yo, when I'm on Twitter. So, yeah, uh, man, like, <laughs> this episode was absolutely crazy. And that's pretty much the episode, as I mentioned before, uh, Liz at this point is pouring her heart out, you know, the music's amazing with the ED playing, and just the voice acting, man. Once again, I gotta praise the voice acting. And that's pretty much the episode ends, but we also, but right before it ends, we see the shot back to with uh, the underworld where the guys are taking down more of the, of, the, of the robes, and you see a bunch of dark knights, you know, from the Americans coming into the bases, just come swooping in, you just see this sh huge shot of them just, of just showing how big the force is, and Gabriel smiling, and that's where it ends. So yeah, man. This episode was fucking amazing. I loved it. Y'all got a big long review out of me. Forty plus minutes. This episode was this episode was awesome. I pardon me for that speech wants to call this the best episode of SAO. Say this is better than the Gabriel episode, say it's better than your know, last episode with Austin, but mm, I think I'm gonna put this at a solid maybe second place, maybe third place. This episode was awesome. It got out it did Rekki did the impossible and actually made me care about Al or not Alice by Liz, I mean and that deserves praise. That deserves to be commended for me, someone who's never liked Liz. Where I, okay, I never. Well, I more or less tolerate her. I could, I, I could, you know, watch her, but I never really liked her. 
and you know, just have me actually, you know, like say, like, yeah, I like Liz now. She is now over with me. It, it, it definitely tell you, definitely, you know, it definitely, you know, I gotta give my man Recky Pross for that. And that whole speech, man, like, that man rectified something he really should have done in the Alfheim arc, and just, you know, just showing us how deep it went, man. That was some crazy stuff, man. And, you know, once again, Alice, Liz's voice out is just pouring her heart out, man. That woman deserves a raise for that. And also, the anime director for that panic shot, great shit. So, yeah, guys. I'm ended here. 45 minutes this is what this review ended up being. A long one. I hope y'all enjoyed this review. Honestly, this is probably one of the better reviews I put out recently for my episode reviews. Lodge with Pack here. I love SCL. And yeah, man. Definitely look forward to we got the last episode of War, the, of War for the Underworld. It's going to be awesome. So yeah, guys. Overall, I'm going to give this episode a 10 out of 10, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you did. Subscribe if you're new. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, flag, at least down in the description box below. And as always, come back for more. See you guys next time.